Non-Monogamy Help is a podcast where your questions about open, non-monogamous or polyamorous relationships are answered. Our host, Lola Phoenix, will consult a licensed therapist with over a decade of experience to address your problems. Names and locations have been changed or censored to keep your questions anonymous. You're listening to Non-Monogamy Help, the podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 55 of the Non-Monogamy Help podcast. I'm Lola Phoenix. Please send your questions to nonmonogamyhelp at gmail.com. I'll either be read in the podcast or the column anonymously. If you want to read the columns and listen to the podcast, you can go to nonmonogamyhelp.com. Subscribe to our newsletter by going to go.nonmonogamyhelp.com forward slash email and follow us on Twitter at nonmonogamyhelp. If you want to support the columns and the podcast, please consider becoming a patron. Even $1 a month can help support the general running of the columns and the podcast, and it's just a general vote of support that I really, really appreciate. So you can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash Lola Phoenix. If you donate five dollars or more a month, your name with your permission will be read at the end of the podcast. Let's get to this week's discussion question. If this is the first time you're hearing this, every week before I read the letter, I put forth a discussion question that you can use with your friends, partners, menomores, or anyone to get them to get to know them a little bit even. I also answer it myself briefly to give you a little bit of context. This week's discussion question is do you believe in first impressions? So I would say that for me it's yes and no. And if you're confused about what that means, first impressions is sort of like the idea that like whatever first impression someone gives you when they meet you, you kind of like use that as a basis to judge the interactions that you have with that person or that person as a whole from then on out. I would say it really depends on what the first impression is. And probably if I get like a not great feeling about someone, and I will kind of like reserve that. I'll try to give people a chance, but like if I have a little bit of a, uh, I don't know about that person, I feel a little bit, uh, then I do tend to trust my gut on things. And that's not to say that I won't like, that I'll kind of like try to tell other people not to be friends with them or anything, but I do kind of think, okay, I don't have a good feeling about that person. I don't, if I know where it's coming from, then I'll think about that. But if I don't know where it's coming from, then I'll just kind of keep that in mind because you never really know where that comes from. And it's always important to pay attention to things like that, I think. Anyway, let me repeat the discussion question just so you have it. Do you believe in first impressions? Now let's get to this week's letter. I've started listening to your podcast on and off in the last few months. One thing that I notice is a recurring theme theme in your advice is that you often say it's none of their business to know all of this stuff about any of the relationships that the letter writer is not involved in. What I'm curious about is where's the line? How much stuff is enough to know? When I'm in a relationship with someone, it's important to have some kind of understanding of each of our existing slash potential relationships in order to navigate the dynamics that will arise and even just from a logistical point of view when planning out time for each other. When meeting someone new, I want to know what kinds of relationships they have in their life so that I can see how they relate to their partners, what kinds of boundaries they may have in place, whether what they have to offer is something I'm interested in. These are difficult things to figure out if there's a cone of silence around all of their other relationships. One time my partner and I tried a mutual agreement of non-disclosure with our respective new relationships. In hindsight, the complete lack of transparency was the biggest driver of it it hurling into disaster. Where we would normally give basic updates on how the relationship is progressing and how we feel about that person, there was absolute silence and we both projected our insecurities into that empty space. It was horrible. My partner and I learned the hard way that too little knowledge did not work and had we been able to provide each other with the updates that we normally would, it would have headed off a lot of the insecurities that all of us were feeling. So I guess I would like to know in your opinion what kind of stuff and how much stuff do you think is appropriate to know about the other relationships that your partner is in? Before I get to the answer to this week's question, I would like to plug two things very quickly. The first thing is our regular podcast sponsor, BetterHelp. Usually I will recommend to people that they see a polyfriendly polyamory friendly therapist for a lot of people looking locally for that kind of support is impossible especially in a global pandemic the good thing about BetterHelp is that you can contact a therapist online anytime that you want you can find um, a therapist that you can send messages to and have sessions with really quickly and they do offer some financial aid you can get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp by using promo code non-monogamy help or going to betterhelp.com forward slash non-monogamy help 
The second thing that I want to plug is a book from a person that I know named Alex Holmes called Time to Talk, and it's really awesome. Um, Alex also has a podcast called Time to Talk, which I recommend you check out. Specifically, the book, I'm going to read the snazzy description of it because it, it frames it a lot better than I could come up with, but it says, We live in a super connected world, yet men specifically struggle to connect and share. This is changing, but not quickly enough. Award-winning podcaster Alex Holmes sets out to accelerate this shift, debunking lingering myths around masculinity, love, and connection by exploring what causes the sense of loneliness. So yeah, I think it's really an awesome book that uh, people should check out who are interested, especially in kind of challenging the things that society teaches us about masculinity that aren't so great sometimes. Um, you can also listen to Alex's podcast, Time to Talk, but yeah, check out Alex's book. You can go to Alex Holmes, that's H-O-L-M-E-S dot co forward slash book to get access to the book and access to Alex's podcast. Now let's get to this week's answer response to the letter. I'm doing really great this week about this. Anyway, yeah, let's get to this week's response. <music> Okay, first of all, when I've said in my podcast or columns, when people have asked me questions and I've said, you know too much or you're too involved, almost in every case, that isn't what you're talking about here. You're talking about wanting to know about logistics or things like that. Th there's, there's kind of an in-between between don't ask, don't tell and knowing every single thing beyond a point where it's kind of like, is there any privacy in, in these relationships? I'm not advocating for people to operate on a don't ask, don't tell basis, which is what it sounds like you were actually operating under. A very strict agreement of complete non-disclosure. That isn't what I'm, at, what I'm saying. That is pretty much don't ask, don't tell. Other than the fact that you may know that your partner is in this other relationship, it is kind of a don't ask, don't tell setup. That's not necessarily what I advocate. What I advocate is supposed to be contrary to the advice that or the instinct that people have to know everything about another relationship and i do kind of think that's working in this in this situation that you're describing people tend to think that if they know everything about the other relationships that their partners are in they can prevent something bad from happening in their relationship the reason why i don't think this is good is because ultimately there's only so much you can control. You cannot control the relationships that your partner is in. And sometimes when you want to know about that relationship, it stems from a desire to want to counteract the anxiety by controlling everything or wanting to know as if that's going to help you foresee something bad. It's, it's a preventative measure. And what I'm saying is that that can't prevent it. When you are in a relationship with somebody and they're in relationships with other people, those relationships that they have with other people should have a reasonable respect of privacy. And it isn't sometimes very fair, sorry about the sirens, it isn't sometimes very fair when, you know, the, your partner is disclosing stuff about the, their other partners to you, to those other partners. It's a balance between the privacy of other people and also, sometimes I feel like people want to know those details because they don't want to actually hold their partner, partner accountable for their decisions. And it's used way too much as an excuse. So for example, if you are dating person B and they are dating person C, they could say to you that person C is getting really upset every single time this happens or that happens. And, and what I feel like is going to happen is you're going to blame person C when person B makes choices based on person C's actions. Instead of going, okay, I get, you know, you, you're welcome, your, your partner's welcome to tell you that their other partner is getting upset, yada yada. But ultimately it's them that's making a decision based on that information. It's them that is choosing, if they are choosing, to change your relationship because of what's happening in other relationships. The thing that I worry about with, with being like, this is what's happening in this relationship and this is what's happening in that relationship, is that rather than being used as a way to talk about dynamics, it's being used as a way to blame other people for what you are choosing to do. And that's why I don't particularly advocate it. I think that it's it tends to be a way that people use to try and avoid things. And sometimes I think it causes more problems. 
yes, you have filled this void of not knowing with your own insecurities, but knowing that isn't going to solve the problem, which is the insecurity. The problem really isn't this void or what's in it. It's the fact that you feel like you need to have this information, and if it's not there, then you'll put it there in order for you to feel comfortable and safe and secure in your relationship. And I do genu genuinely feel like, regardless of whether you have no information and you're putting information in there, or you do have information, the initial problem is that you feel like you need to know this to solve the, the fear and the insecurities and the, the doubt that you are experiencing. And that is the issue. That is the real problem. Not whether or not that information is there. It's the fact that you feel like there, so, there should be something there for you to feel safe and secure in your relationship. And that is kind of what it boils down to. Now, there's different things that you mentioned along here. You said it's important to have some kind of an understanding of each of our in existing potential relationships in order to navigate the dynamics that arise, even just from a logistical point of view and planning out time for each other. You can have a partnership with someone who communicates to you how they do relationships without necessarily knowing tons about other people. So for example, if I had a new partnership and I would say, okay, this is how my life is organized. I have a partner that I live with. Generally speaking, that partner that I live with does tend to take up a lot of my time because we live together and there's logistical planning. However, in terms of how I do relationships, I am not a person who believes in prioritizing anyone just because I've been with them longer. So I would highlight to them that if they feel like I am not giving them the time that they need, or if they feel like that I am prioritizing my relationship with the person I live with over them, then they need to highlight that to me because that is not what I intended. However, what I would say is that I do have a disability. I do have a condition which makes my energy levels low. I don't always have access to the best transportation because I can't drive, things like that. Like they have to, depending on where they live and where, where they are in their life, you know, if I, if I had a, another partner that basically wanted me to be their primary, that wouldn't work. I don't have the time or energy for that. So it's about figuring out what your individual preferences are, what your commitments are, what all of those things are. I don't need to tell them intimate details about my partnership of the person that I live with in order for them to get a good understanding of what place they would have in my life. And I don't even know what that would entail. Like, what is it about my partner and my relationship with the person that I live with that you would need to know in order to understand things? You need to be able to trust me when I say, this is the time I have. This is the place that you would occupy in my life. This is, you know, how I operate. You would have to trust me in order for that to work. Maybe you don't immediately trust somebody's word. You need to see it in action in order to get a good idea of it. So that that is that's one thing I'd say about that. Somebody can pretend like they are and this is this is actually it's quite funny that this comes up because for a very, very long time, I felt like relationship anarchy was just something that people who didn't want to take responsibility used as a cover for, you know, to say I don't have any priorities when actually they do. Um, I have kind of since come to believe and, and understood relationship anarchy a little bit better and what it's supposed to mean, even though I think that people don't always use it to mean that in a similar way to anarchy in general. People can lie about things, you know, they can say, oh, I don't have any primaries, I don't really, you know, da -da -da -da, and then make decisions that counter that. But the thing of it is, you can't prevent everything. You can't prevent yourself from getting in a relationship where your needs don't meet up, where, where your needs don't match up, where somebody isn't honest, or maybe it doesn't even know. Like some people just aren't self-aware enough to know where they're making their decisions and why. So that's possibility. Like, and, and there's nothing that you observing them and their other relationships or knowing any details about that isn't, isn't necessarily going to prevent that. And you have to understand that part of entering into multiple relationships includes the risk that those relationships will end. That's just part and parcel of the risk. So I still think that you wanting to know the dynamics of someone else's relationship is partially a way to shield yourself from heartbreak. And you need to maybe, all of this is a very anxious response, which is understandable. It's totally understandable that you would want to try and protect yourself. That's not a bad thing. But ultimately, this is creating a lot more problems than there needs to be. 
You know, when you talk about you and your partner tried this mutual agreement of non-disclosure with your respective new relationships, the lack of transparency was the biggest driver of it, hur driver of it hurtling into disaster. Okay, you would normally give basic updates on how the relationship is progressing and how we feel about that person, but there was an absolute silence where we both projected our insecurities. What you need to figure out is how does another relationship increasing in terms of feeling and how you feel about that person, how the relationship is progressing, progressing into what? If, if you're feeling this fear, it's because you haven't talked about what relationship progression means. It means different things to different people. Are you on the relationship escalator? Is is one of you expecting to marry someone else? Like, that's the discussion that needs to happen. That's what you need to work out with each other, is where you fall into each other's lives. And you have to trust each other to talk to each other if that changes. But having regular updates about, I mean, if my... <laughs> If someone asked me that, like, how is your relationship progressing? And how do you feel about that other person? Like, I would feel really, what do you mean? Progressing into what? I don't, I don't, you know, I, I have no intentions upon getting married. I have no intentions of having children. I have no interest in purchasing property or any of the other sort of general milestones people have for relationship progression. So what does that mean to me? You're, you're asking these questions because you're afraid of your partner falling in love with somebody else and you being replaced. That's what it feels like. And whether or not you have this information, I'm sure it felt great. I'm sure when you, when your partner said, well, I don't know if I love this person yet, but we're seeing how things go. I'm sure you felt very relieved by that. I don't doubt that for a second. And I'm sure when you didn't have that information, you started to panic. But the, but the issue is, is the panic. The, the issue isn't the information being there. It's the fact that you feel like you need this for some reason. Why? Why do you need that? Can you not work together to sort out your insecurities and figure out why you feel so anxious? How do you reestablish a relationship with each other that means that you don't worry about things like that? You don't need updates like that. You have to also accept that regardless of getting these general updates, at any point in time, your partner could be like, nah, I'm done. I'm done with our relationship. These updates are not going to prevent that. These updates are not going to shield you from that. It's not going to make it easier for you. Even if you had these, up even if you like, okay, your partner's like, oh, I just met this person. Next update. Oh, I'm dating. Next update. Oh, I'm starting to fall for this person. Next update. Oh, I love this person. Next update. I don't want us to be together no more. Do you really think that the progression of those updates is going to somehow prepare you mentally for losing that partner? It's not going to. Your brain is trying to help and it's trying to, to do something with all of this fear, understandable fear that it has that you will lose your partner, but these updates aren't going to, they will temporarily make you feel better, no doubt, no doubt. But you need to address the fact that you're feeling, you're filling what you see as a void with insecurity sorry you need to address that and figure out how you counteract that insecurity instead of just trying to, to to feed the information in because it's it's not actually it does make you feel better in in the temporary but it's a temporary solution it's a band-aid over a gaping wound it isn't fixing the actual problem and that's why this situation devolved the way it did because when you can't, you know, you need that and you haven't addressed the core issue. So when you don't get that information for whatever reason, and you might not, you might not get that information. You when when you don't get that information, all of a sudden you're filling it with insecurities and you're scared. So you need to figure out why it is that you and your partner either, you know, if, if you felt insecurity on both sides, which it sounds like that was the case, you need to figure out how you build up more trust with each other rather than trying to fill a, a you know w with regular updates like you don't tell me how long you've been with your partner so i'm not sure if this is necessarily new and even if you have been with them for a long time if you have just started trying out polyamory it makes sense that you would have all of these insecurities but yeah i can't give you a hard and fast answer of what kind of stuff and how much stuff is appropriate it's not necessarily about what kind of stuff or how much stuff it's about what's the purpose of this what is the point? Is the point to try and stave off fear and anxiety? Because if the point is trying to stave off fear and anxiety, I don't think that's useful. Because in the long run, it won't prevent anything. And sometimes knowing these details can, tri can trigger more anxiety. 
Sometimes if you're, if, you know, if your next update or your partner is have fallen completely head over heels in love with this person, and you, then it might be your brain goes, well, wow, they fell in love faster with this person than they did with me. What's going on there? Like, it's sometimes more information is more for your anxiety to work with. Ultimately, it comes down to what you and your partner are comfortable with. Comfortable with. If you're comfortable with regular updates, then you know who am I to tell you to stop doing that? If it if it's not a violation of the privacy of the other person who is involved, and you should always check that, and you feel comfortable with that, then go ahead. But the one thing that I would just say is that it's not necessarily about you know how much or what not to know. It's about whether or not it's actually serving you to know. Is it actually solving the situation? Will it actually do what you are trying to prevent? Will it prevent what you're, what you're trying to get it to prevent? Because usually I feel like people are sharing this kind of updates or sharing this kind of information in order to prevent something from happening that it cannot prevent. And that is why I tend to tell people that they're too involved because they're trying to be too involved to be able to stop their partner from leaving them. And ultimately they cannot do that through this method. They can't do it at all. If somebody decides to leave you, uh, short of locking them <laughs> in, in a tower, which isn't really going to fix the situation, you can't stop that. You can't stop your partner from leaving you. You can't stop your partner from falling out of love with you. None of that is, is a thing that you can control. And temporarily, as I've said, if, if you haven't already read it, I wrote this um, article called 13 Mistakes People Make When Trying Polyamory. I suggest you check it out as well. One thing that people tend to do is that their brain in these types of situations says what can I do to keep this person in my life because I'm afraid of losing them I know I'll do XYZ and it's an easy solution it's much easier and nicer and, and less traumatic and less scary for your brain to think that if you do XYZ then your partner won't leave you now you can be a complete and total asshole obviously you know the best thing you can do to keep your partner around is by being a respectful person, being treating them well, treating yourself well, all of those things. But outside of that, there isn't anything you can do. And your brain will trick you into believing that, that you can do things in order to temporarily relieve some of that fear and anxiety. But the problem with this is that in the long run, what this inevitably ends up meaning is that you lost that relationship because you didn't do XYZ. And other relationships that you've had, you've lost because you didn't do XYZ. This mind kind of like temporarily anxiety relieving thing ends up really screwing you over in the long run because it blames you for the things that happen in other relationships that you could not control and that's the problem with that mindset is it doesn't prevent the thing you want it to prevent and it ends up creating more blame for you so yeah Basically, to sum up, there isn't a hard, fast rule other than the privacy and respect for the third person and, and or the other person, people that your partner is dating about what to disclose or how much to not know. The only thing you really need to consider yourself with is, is what will knowing this information do? What problem will this solve? And will it actually solve that problem? Because in the example you gave, the problem is that you know, you see this void, you're filling this void with anxious thoughts, and you think that replacing it with updates will fix it, when the actual problem is that you feel like you need this information in order to feel secure in your relationship, and that is the actual problem. And that is something that you should think about. How do we build security between each other? What is relationship progression? What does that mean? What is the end goal? What is the ideal situation for yourself and your partner do your ideals you know this is my ideal polyamorous situation and this is your partner's do they mesh up are you compatible <laughs> because at the end of the day you know that's kind of what you're asking with the relationship progression you're you're afraid of being replaced you're afraid of things changing you can't prevent that you you need to discuss with each other what your situations are and if you want it to change and also respect that even discussing that and knowing that doesn't mean it can't change in the future shit happens life happens the only thing that's constant is change so you can't ultimately prevent it you have to sit with that discomfort and be able to get used to it and trust your partner that if something were going to change in your relationship and change in your expectations that they would discuss it with you and that they would be there to support you because if you don't feel like that's the case then that is ultimately the bigger issue than knowing about what's going on in their other relationships i hope that helps and good luck 
Thank you for listening to episode 55 of Non-Monogamy Help. If you want to be awesome, you can donate to our Patreon. Donating $5 or more a month means that your name, with your permission, will be read at the end of the podcast. This week's current patrons are Laura Boylan, Chris Albury-Jones, Duke, and James Wartell. If for whatever reason you can't become a patron because life happens, then if you can take five minutes to log into iTunes, find the podcast rate and review it, that would be really, really helpful. It helps me get the podcast out to new people. If you don't want to write a review, that's totally fine. You can just do a rating. That's also appreciated. So yeah, if you have five minutes to spare, please do that if you can. That's all for this week. You'll get a new column next Friday and another podcast episode in a fortnight. Thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to Non-Monogamy Help. Our podcast music has been provided by Chris Albury-Jones at albury-jones.com and the art was made by Dom Jung at d-o-m-d-u-o-n-g.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>